So uh, if, you're, if you're visiting, checking in for the first time, this year, the entire year, we've had one grand theme we've been considering. It's a theme of discipleship. Or uh, put, it, put it another way, how do we grow spiritually as followers of Christ? And we've said uh, that there are three targets that every follower of Christ should be aiming at. We should be aiming to grow in Christ-likeness. I want to be like Jesus in my character. And Christ-likeness has to do with, with what's inside my heart. Janice received a card uh, a couple of days ago, and it said on it, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. And I, I don't remember what the card was for, but I said, that'll preach. That's what Christ-likeness is. And then we're to grow in fruit, fruitfulness. This theme we're considering this summer. And fruitfulness has to do with what, what the moral output of our lives our calling and living purposeful lives, the things we're to live for, the things we're to accomplish. That's what we're talking about this summer. And then the third thing we're all to shoot to aim for as disciples of Christ is what? Christ-likeness, fruitfulness, and knowledge. We haven't got to that yet, but we'll do that in the fall. Yeah, so Christ-likeness and fruitfulness is like this beautiful vine that, we're, that Jesus wants to grow in us. And knowledge is like the trellis that holds the vine up. It supports it so that, that we can, uh, this growth is preserved and protected. So that's the big picture of where we've been going. Now we're talking about how to grow in fruitfulness. And we've been using this summer uh, a great teaching tool by Pastor Rick Warren called the Shape Tool which helps us to look at our lives and discern ways in which we can serve God with our lives. SHAPE is an acronym. S stands for spiritual gifts. And we've just spent quite a few weeks talking about 24 different spiritual gifts the Bible says that the Lord gives to, to His people. And now we're going to really step up the pace as we move on to letters H and A to talk about something called our heart and our abilities, and we're going to take both of those uh, together this morning. Part of our vision for Bridgeway is that everyone who says this is their church family will not sit on the sidelines, but they'll get on the field using their shape to serve the Lord, to live out their purpose, and grow God's kingdom in Southern Maryland and, be want, uh, and beyond. And we want everyone who's a part of this church to begin to experience the joy of living a fruitful life. That's what this series is all about. So, let's talk about the heart for a few minutes. I love talking about the heart. And the Bible does too. It mentions the word heart more than 600 times. So it's an important concept for us to get, to, uh, get our brains around. When the, the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about what we could describe as the motivational center of uh, our being, where our mind and our will and emotions all come together to make decisions about what we're going to do. The heart is, is like the, the control room in the Pixar movie Inside Out. How many of you have seen Inside Out? That's what the heart is like, where, let's see, what are they? Joy, sadness, fear, anger, and disgust. They all get together. That's the heart. And they agree, and when they agree, it's an awesome thing. So the, the heart, as Rick Warren teaches it, is, is when we, we, we come to something that we, we do, that all of us just gets fired up about, gets excited about. David says, I'll give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. And, and he's not saying, I do, I, I, I'm jumping up and down, I'm so happy. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, every part of my being is oriented to you, God. I want to do your will. And so when it comes, uh, it, it comes to our lives, there are these things that we, we do that just captures the attention, the imagination of, of all of me. And that's what we're talking about here. Rick Warren says, says of this, I think this quote is on your note sheet. And again, you're going to want your note sheet if you've got it handy today because there's a couple little exercises that we're going to do together. Um, but Rick Warren says, God has given each of us a unique emotional heartbeat that races when we encounter activities, subjects, or circumstances that interest us. This God-given motivation serves as an eternal, internal guidance system for our lives. It determines what your interests are and what will bring you the most satisfaction and fulfillment. Another word that we could use to describe uh, these passions is the word calling. It's a word that the Bible uses quite often. Why, why am I on this earth? What is God calling me to do? Have you ever asked questions like that? 
Well, look in part to the passions that God has given you, and that will be one indication of, of, of what his purpose and call is for your life. You talk about call. The problem with too many followers of Christ today, too many people in the church, is that they live their lives as if they have no call, as if there is no direction for their lives. I see a lot of aimlessness in the church today. And I, I've been puzzling why that is. Why that, that is. You would think followers of Christ of all people should be living with a high sense of purpose. I think uh, a number of reasons. You can jot some of these down. I think bad theology is one reason. There's a long, unfortunate tradition in some sectors of Christian thinking that says that the ones with a call in the church are really the pastors, the missionaries, the professors, you know, the professionals. They have the call. And you see this division between clergy and laity in many churches. Divisions between what is sacred and what is secular. Well, this is just terrible boneheaded thinking, dividing everything up in, in, in this way. Every single one of us should wake up in the morning, and when we get around to having our devotions, whenever that is, we should, each one of us, be saying, Lord, how can I serve you today? And would you give me the strength to please you in the things that I do today? That's, that's for each one of us, not just the professionals. We're all called to serve Christ. Janice and I went to England for a year to work in the inner city for a year, a uh, kind of little missionary uh, uh, ambition that we had. And when we came back from England, I had a choice to make on which vocation I would pursue. This was early in our marriage. Would I be a pastor or would I follow my heart? I had studied journalism in college. Would I enter into a journalism path? And I had a choice to make and chose the pastoral call. Now, when I made that choice, I was not choosing a higher call over this mundane, simplistic, journalistic job. No, if I had chosen journalism, that would have been equally as high a call as being a pastor. This is one of the great spiritual truths that was uncovered by the Protestant Reformation. The priesthood of all believers. William Tyndale, who was the first one to give us the whole Bible in English. And guess what happened to him because he did that? They burned him at the stake. Hmm. William Tyndale said famously, if our desire is to please God, then fetching water, washing dishes, cobbling shoes, and preaching the Bible is all one. So, disciples of Christ, you and me should not be living dull, bored, aimless lives if you follow Jesus. I think there are other reasons, though, why we slip into living life without a sense of God's call. Uh, life's just so busy is a thing, yes? We fill up our calendars, we flip from one activity to another. We do, with, do the same with our kids, you know, we cart them off to soccer practice and dance recitals and piano lessons. We ignore God's beautiful gift of the Sabbath and teach our kids to do, do the same. And then we collapse, wrung out at our, you know, on our beds at night and, and we think that's normal. It's really unhealthy. It's one of the lessons, I think, uh, that the pandemic taught us that we need to slow down. The world is too much with us, said the poet Wordsworth. I think for many, uh, we're just so distracted, is another thing. Keeps us from sensing call. I see a world of tech zombies wandering around. You know what I mean? Uh, yes. Our games, our streaming services, all of it is sucking us dry. We are amusing ourselves to death like a bestseller from a, a few years ago. I think every one of us should observe frequent fasts from tech. You know, where you say to the kids, all right, phones in the basket, TV and computers off, let's go outside. Let's break out the board games. Hmm? And parents need to be especially vigilant with their kids. I mean, think about it. When the people who work at the highest levels of social media companies do not allow their children to have phones or social media accounts, that should be saying something to us. Another reason we may live purposeless lives, void of calling, is it's going to hurt. Many of us are just plain lazy. Everybody say like E.T. Ouch! <laughs> the Bible word is sloth. 
Dorothy Sayer wrote this about sloth. This is on your note sheet too. A couple great quotes. That's why you want these note sheets. Sloth is the sin which believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and only remains alive because there is nothing it would die for. Describes many people around us. So how do we recover our sense of calling for our lives? I read a great book a couple years ago by a Christian writer named Os Guinness, and it's called The Call, How to Live a Fruitful Life and discover God's purpose for your life. Os Guinness would say there's two things we ought to do. First of all, we absolutely must reconnect with my life's primary calling. you got to reconnect with your primary calling, and, and oddly enough, it has nothing to do with sports or work or jobs, or school, or finding love, or becoming successful in life. None of that is your primary calling. You say, well, what is it then? Now it's time for a Sunday school answer. Psalm 100 says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. My primary call is to know, deep down in my bones, that I am made by God and for God. That is my primary calling. And nothing else matters if you miss this. Your call to be a singer or a writer or an athlete or a world, world traveler or a successful businessman, the next Elon Musk, it's all pointless if you don't start here. Say this, I am made by God and for God. Say those words. I am made by God and for God. Colossians 1.16, all things were created through him and for him, referring to Jesus Christ. So uh, here's a simple exercise you can do if you want to discover this for yourself. Do a word study. A word study is where you take a word, any word, and look up how it is used in the Bible. It's a very useful devotional technique. So look up the word call or some version of it and see how often it's used in the Bible and you'll be amazed by what you discover. It begins with your very conversion. Jesus said in Luke chapter 5, I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. In other words, you couldn't even be a Christian if God hadn't called you first. Romans 1.7, you were called to be saints. Romans 8.28, you were called according to his purpose. And this is just a sampling of those, those verses. So st step one, get your primary call sorted out. First things first, you're made by God and for God, so start living as, as if that is true. Then secondly, once you're clear on that, Os Guinness would say, then discover and pursue the secondary callings which God has given you. And what do we mean by this? We mean all the things we're talking about today in this shape study. So look at your heart, discover the things that you're passionate about, realize it's God who gave you those passions, and start developing and using some of them to serve God and others. And you'll recover a sense of calling for your life. So some people ha are, are thinking, well, how do I discover what I'm passionate about? And there's part of me when I hear that question that goes like, really? What are you passionate about? I mean, isn't there like a gravitational pull uh, uh, on some of those things? I remember when I was four or five, I strapped a tennis racket to me with a belt, like a guitar, and then stood up to the, the vacuum cleaner to sing. Okay? So that was a twofer. I think, you know, because I, I, I play guitar and I'm good at racket sports, especially racquetball. I think that was a sign. Yes? Jordan Peterson, by the way, who I love, I, I, I hope you've gotten to discover Jordan Peterson. He, among all, many of the brilliant things he says, he's saying, parents, you've got to let your kids play. He gave a big lecture on the importance of play. Just ha letting the kids have undirected playtime. Don't fill their schedule with one activity or another. They need time to go out and just mess around because as they do that, they're unleashing their imagination. They're playing at roles and, 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 and activities, and they're trying things out through that playtime, and by that they're discovering, they don't know it, but this is what they're doing, they're discovering how they're made, how God has called them. They need rich playtime. Jim and, Jimmy and Natalie are like, <laughs> <laughs> but just watching your boys, they love to play. 
Isn't it amazing? When I was in second grade, I asked uh, for a Christmas present, a dictionary. I wanted a dictionary and because my parents had observed that I, I had started writing. In third grade, I wrote a 20-page story. In seventh grade, I wrote a 200-page novel, handwritten in spiral notebooks. I think writing was going to be a thing for, for me. That, so that's one way to discover your passions. Look back at, at your childhood. Look back at, at the things that interested you, the accomplishments you had, what people recognized you for. One thing I didn't have was a gift in craftsmanship, which we talked about. My dad the, and I made a Pinewood Derby car for Boy Scouts, and it's the only car in the history of Pinewood Derbies that burst into flame on the way down. I think that was a clue to me that that wasn't going to be my thing, my call. So your passions are your passions. But if it helps, Rick Warren has come up with a handy-dandy list of things that you can think through here, and we can call it an I love to list. I've got the list on your note sheet. I'm just going to read through, through it here. And as, we, as I just read through these things real quick, just make a mental note or maybe an actual note, maybe a check mark or a circle. Uh, if you think these passions are in you. I love to design and develop. Some of you have that passion. You love to make something out of nothing. I love to pioneer. I love to test out and try new concepts. I'm not afraid to risk failure. I love to organize. Some of you, that's your passion. You love to bring order out of chaos. I love to operate and maintain. That's an actual passion some people have. I love to serve or help. I love to acquire or possess. I love to shop, collect, or obtain things. That's not all bad. Just hang on to your wallet. I enjoy getting the highest quality for the best price. I love to excel. I love to be the best and make my team the best. You know, that's, that's a passion. I don't want to just settle for, uh, for good enough. Sometimes I want to pursue excellence. I love to influence. I love to perform. I love to improve things and make them better. I love to repair things. Not my gift, not my passion. You know, when I, when once we were wrestling, playing, and we kicked a hole in the wall, you know, know how my dad, God, God bless him, fixed it, moved a piece of furniture in front of it. <laughs> That's how it ended, yeah, just saying. I love to lead and be in charge. I love to persevere. You're not a quitter. I love to follow rules. I love to operate by policies and procedures. Nothing wrong with that. That can be a passion. We need people like that. I love to prevail. I don't quit. I'm not a quitter. I love to persevere. So this is just a sampling here, but just going through this list of things you can be passionate about proves that, that great old Elton John song from The Lion King. I think it was the circle of life. From the day we arrive on the planet and blinking, step into the sun, there's more to see that can ever be seen more to do than can ever be done. There's far too much to take in here, more to find than can ever be found. So what are you waiting for? What are you wasting time for? Remember your Walt Whitman. You are here and life exists and the powerful play goes on and you get to contribute a verse. So what's your verse? Find it and then sing it or write it, or paint it, or build it, or lead it, or create it, or grow it, or raise it, or enjoy it, and do it gratefully and worshipfully as you do that. For it all passes way too soon into eternity where the powerful play will go on, but for real this time. And what you'll discover when we're on the other side, what we'll discover is that all of this was just rehearsal, a setup. A preparation for marvelous things to come that we can scarcely, scarcely ask for or imagine. Your primary call is to God. Your secondary call is to discover how God has wired you and made you and then use those things for His glory and live for Him. Os Guinness tells the story in his book of the great jazz saxophonist Johnny Coltrane. Nearly destroyed his life early in his career with drugs and alcohol, but in 1957, he had a, a conversion experience, a come to Jesus moment where he gave his life to Christ. He uh, uh, 
then composed a few years after that a, f a very famous piece called, considered his masterpiece, an album, a 33-minute album called A Love Supreme. And in the liner notes to that album, he wrote this, in the year 1957, I experienced by the grace of God a spiritual awakening which was to lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive life. And, and that, that album, A Love Supreme, is a tribute to God. A Love Supreme. The Love Supreme that saved him. And it's a 33-minute long jazz rhapsody of improvisational magic. It's just one long piece where Coltrane takes a simple musical bass line and with his small band, he just repeats it over and over again, changing keys. He changes keys 12 times along the way. And it's, it's, it's absolute brilliance. One musical scholar said of this piece that Coltrane wrote that he was trying to convey the idea musically that anywhere you look and everywhere you look, love supreme can be found. God is that close to each one of us. He didn't play the piece live often, but Os Guinness in his uh, book tells this story that after one extraordinary rendition of Love Supreme, Coltrane stepped off the stage. He put down his sax saxophone and he said to the audience two words, Nuke Dementis. If you don't know it, Nuke Dementis are two Latin words and they're used to translate a famous prayer of an old man named Simeon, who in the Bible, in the, in the story of Luke, Simeon is told by God that he will not die until he sees the Messiah with his own eyes. And the time comes, and he holds the baby Christ in his arms. And seeing this and weeping, he cries out, Lord, let your servant now depart in peace. Nuke Dementis. I've seen your salvation, God. I am ready to, to die. So when Johnny Coltrane said, Nuke Dementis, Guinness writes, he felt he would never play the piece more perfectly. If his whole life had been lived for that passionate 33-minute jazz prayer, it would have been worth it. He was ready to go. And so, my friends, what is your nuke dementis? That's what we're talking about with the heart. Find out what it is and live for it and serve God with it. That's what it means to serve God with all your heart. Oh, I love talking about the heart, if you can't tell. Let's talk for a few minutes as we come down the home stretch about abilities. How do we serve God with our abilities, and what's the relationship with these two? There is a similarity, both what I can do in, with my heart and what I do with my abilities. They are things that I can do. But there's a primary difference. What do you think the difference might be? With the heart, these are things that I will skip sleep and meals and to do these things. I love them so much. With abilities, we're just talking about things we can do. End of story. They're competencies of ours. We won't jump out of bed to do these things. I don't necessarily get excited to do them. But if you need me to do this, that would help you out. You got it. As with our heart, Pastor Rick has done some heavy lifting here that so we can you know, kind of discern more easily what some of our abilities might be. So we've got a list here that he's created. Let me just read through them really quickly again for those listening who don't have a note sheet. And again, think as I read through these, oh, that's me. Oh, uh, maybe. Oh, not so much. An entertaining ability to perform, act, dance, speak, magic, do cartwheels. Do cartwheels. Recruiting ability, that's an ability to enlist and, and motivate others. Interviewing ability, that's an ability. Researching ability, how many are research hounds? Quite a few of you. Artistic ability, we honored our artists uh, last week. Graphics ability, evaluating ability, you need people who can do this. Planning ability, managing, counseling, you're a good listener. Teaching, writing, editing, promoting, repairing. Who are, who are our fixer-uppers? What if you want to? <laughs> <laughs> you want to be able to do all these things, but you can't. Well, yeah, well you can't. And you, yeah, that's why we need each other, isn't it? Uh, re uh, feeding ability. That's interesting. 
you have a gift of cooking, that's a blessing. Recall ability, you got a good memory. Mechanical operating ability. Resourceful ability, you can reach out, search out things. Counting ability, boy, if you're good with numbers, you can go a long way with that. Classifying ability, public relations ability, welcoming, you have a gift of hospitality. Composing ability, landscaping, decorating. 26 abilities here. Now, there, as, I, as I was doing this exercise the other day, there were two things that came to mind, and I've got a little blank spot at the end of your note sheet saying final thoughts. I want you to write these down. If I were to redo the note sheet, I'd be a little more specific here. But here are two lessons that we can learn from considering our abilities. My first takeaway is a simple one. I can never say to God, there's nothing I can do. You can never say that to God. Just looking at this list right here, 26 different things. And this, this, what's mind-blowing about this list, it's nowhere near to being complete. Rick Warren says, uh, and I haven't, I haven't uh, cross-checked him on this, but he says there are studies that have been done that show that the average human has anywhere from three to 400 abilities. Now, we're talking about just very specific things here, so like... The ability to write is itself has like 30 different skills that you're using. What are some things you're doing when you write? We're talking about manual de dexterity, eye-hand coordination, the use of sight, knowledge of writing, reading. You know, and you just start thinking about it, unpacking it, it's like, wow. And for someone who, say, has par paralysis in a hand and they can't write, they're they come to appreciate how dear those abilities are. So when you say to God, got nothing, Lord. The Lord says, talk to the hand. And when you talk to the Lord's hand, you're going to use 43 gifts, or abilities at least when you do that. I know because the Lord said to me many times, talk to the hand, son. So identifying my abilities has another important lesson to teach us. God gives us responsibilities that go beyond my call and passions. God gives me responsibilities that go beyond my call and passion. If you're married, it doesn't matter where, whether you are filled with warm fuzzies about your spouse and, and uh, yeah, I'm called to this marriage. I, uh, no, you are responsible to that other person to make this the best marriage you can. Hmm? And get the help you need if you need it. Doesn't matter how you feel. If you have kids, you don't have to feel euphoria about the fact that you've got kids. <laughs> Just saying. Jason and Jenna, I think you're watching today, and, and I forgot to mention, I was going to mention it earlier, have welcomed uh, their newest one. A Amos, did I get that right? Amos, what's the middle name? Amos Elliott, into the world, safely born. Did we get any uh, data, any statistics for those that are 7-8? Seven, eight? Born on Friday. He's a hairy little thing. He's very uh, beautiful. I mean, I meant to say he's a handsome young man. Woo. You know, but um, I know Jenna's feeling euphoria right now. <laughs> Okay, they didn't sleep last night. She's not, you can text with us. But anyway, the point is, if you have kids, it doesn't care whether you're called to be a parent, you're responsible for raising up the next generation for Christ, so you do the best job you can. You know, if we stopped this study this morning with our heart, just talking about what we're passionate about, you know, we might be tempted to think when presented with an opportunity to serve, well, I don't feel so passionate about that thing. I don't think that's my calling. It's not my spiritual gift. I'm not going to do it. And if we would think that way or say those words, it would be sinful for us to do so. We said a couple weeks ago, there is no spiritual gift of stacking chairs. And then as soon as I said that, Chris later <laughs> sent me a Babylonian, was that Babylonian B? Article about a man who claimed his gift was stacking chairs. Now, Babylonian B is satirical, but it was hilarious. Thank you, Chris. He's, a, he's got the research thing going. So the idea here, when we look at our abilities, 
the idea here is that Jesus is trying to cultivate in us the desire to imitate him and develop a heart of service. Jesus said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, then you must become servant of all. The Old Testament standard of service was to love your neighbor as yourself. That was the standard in the Old Testament. The Jesus standard of serving is we are to love others as Christ has loved us. That raises the bar considerably. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2, in humility, count others better than yourself. Notice the bar just went up. Not love others like I love myself. No. Love them better than I love myself. It's a higher bar. But notice as well, when Paul says that, love others, uh, see others better than yourself. Notice what he's not saying. He's not saying ignore yourself. He's not saying, stop taking care of yourself, pretend you don't exist, make sure that you're a rug and let everybody walk on you, serve endlessly. That's not Christianity. Janice and I, after the service, are going to head up to New Hampshire for a few days, take a pastor's weekend and tack on a few extra days because we've had a busy stretch, and uh, we're going to go play and take care of ourselves for a couple of days back next week. It's actually work because we're going to see Nick and Julianne up in New Hampshire, so I'm going to make a pastor's call on them. Take care of your... <laughs> okay, yeah. The Bible says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Notice the language, offer your bodies. You are still in charge of you. Other people's needs do not rule you. You rule you. But the choices you make now as a follower of Christ of how you use your time and your resources and your energy, now it will be made with Christ's example in front of me. And with his strength, you serve him and others as he leads you, whether it's your call or your passion or not. The good Samaritan did not stop and help the guy who had been mugged and left by the roadside to die. He did not stop and help him because he had the spiritual gift of mercy. He helped him because it was the right thing to do. That's what this section on abilities teaches me. And here is yet another reason why I want more people like this in this world. I want more followers of Christ to exist on the earth right now. Don't you want more people like this, like we're talking about? People who have an inner circuit breaker inside of them. And whenever they're tempted to act selfishly or immorally, that circuit breaker trips as a warning to them. I want more people with that circuit breaker inside of them. Followers of Christ are people who have an inner, I don't even know how to describe it, an inner notification chime that goes off periodically, a reminder to them to help others, to serve others. I want people who have that instinct inside of them because this is what a follower of Christ is. A follower of Christ is someone who has the spirit of Christ inside their hearts, the word of Christ inside their brains, the grace of Christ surrounding them, guiding them, helping them, and the forgiveness of Christ available to them should they mess up, and they will, because we're not talking about perfect people here with followers of Christ. But we are talking about a different sort of person here. And these people, if there were more of them, would make this world a lot better place. And I want that for each one of you and anybody watching online. I want you to be a follower of Christ because that is why you were created. You were made by him and for him to be this kind of person. How do you become this kind of person? You ask him for it. You come to Jesus, you bow before him, you ask him to forgive you for how you've messed up in your life and you surrender. You say words like these, and in fact, just say this after me. It's not magic. You won't turn into a Bible if you say it, but just as an illustration of, say these words. Lord, I'm done trying to do life on my own. I will follow you, Jesus. I will serve you, Jesus. You died for me, so I'll live for you. You rose for me. So from here on out, I ask you to be my North Star and my constant companion, my Lord, my Savior, my best friend. 
in words of your own choosing, Again, there was nothing magical to that, but if you were to pray words like that and mean them, it would mean all the world to you and all the difference for you. The Bible says if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's that simple. And your life will never be the same from that point on. It won't be easier. That is not part of the deal. But it will be better by far. So, what are you waiting for? Give Jesus your life and then serve him with all your heart and all your abilities.